Are you in college? The Thomistic Institute Study Abroad program is now accepting applications for the spring semester of 2024. This unique and exciting study abroad program offers you the opportunity to spend a semester in Rome at the Dominican Order's Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas. You'll study the ancient and medieval intellectual tradition of Rome, live with like-minded young men and women steps from the Colosseum, and participate in weekly cultural and intellectual events, regular day trips, and multi-day excursions. To learn more about this life-changing opportunity, go to ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. That's ThomisticInstitute.org slash Rome. Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. Let's just start with a short prayer. In the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. A pure heart create for me, O God. Put a steadfast spirit within me. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Dominic, pray for us. All right, thank you so much. It's lovely to be here. Um, As a thanksgiving, especially to Father Dominic, and speaking of distraction, I was looking at the Secunda Secunde, the question about the necessity of self-love. I was intending to take the Latin text and set it to some Whitney Houston songs for mass antiphons in the future, maybe, or, yeah, prefaces or something like that, but I just, I ran out of time, so I'm sorry, Father. It's not bad, but it's pretty bad. Okay. So, yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I, 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 yeah, my husband does way more um, Thomistic Institute talks than I do. I'm sorry to read from a screen, but just more greater flexibility. Um, but it's a privilege to be here. The numbers are fantastic, and I'm blown away by your love for the Lord and, and your intellectual dis- discipline commitment. Um, and I'm grateful not only to Father Dominic, but all the Dominicans who have been a huge part of my formation. I was received in the church, I think it was 11 years ago. Anyway, after I finished my PhD in theology. Um, and so I had to sort of be reformed as an academic theologian. I wasn't even teaching at the time. I was at home with kids um, and homeschooling somewhat. And my contact with different Dominicans coming down here for conferences, seeing Dominican for direction, huge part of my uh, formation as a Catholic and as a theologian. So anything I say that's dumb is my fault. The good stuff is inspired by the, the higher truth of the correct and true state of life and spirituality, which is basically Dominican. I hear all the time, <laughs> oh, we're having a nation retreat, or I'm a Carmelite. It's like all the good stuff those guys said is basically is Dominican stuff. So, but <laughs> there you go. Okay, so the title of my talk, Living, and this is why we flipped and had Father Brent do his um, twice in a row. It's meant to signal a more practical approach to this question. And it, this could go in many ways, and I'll explain why I'm, I've chosen the things that I have. Um, but already in some of your really intelligent questions, I'm getting the signal that th- this is another dimension of the contemplative life that we need to talk about. What might it look like, contemplative life, when you're in the world, in a married state, when you're an expert physicist, when you're a, um, a carpenter? Um, I'm taking a cue from Father Brent here by using the term contemplative as opposed to intellectual, but I will use them interchangeably because everything I'm saying pretty much comes from this book, which is called, in French, The Intellectual Life. But I appreciate the point about we don't want to read intellectual as merely headiness or something like that. Um, I'm talking about reflecting on the life of the mind as, on the one hand, a habitus and a set of practices. He's done all the heavy lifting here for me theologically speaking, but just as, as an initial remark, why I use the term habitus, usually for St. Thomas, the difference being made there is between, on the one hand, a habitus, on the other hand, a motus, or a movement. Now, we translate habitus into English as a habit, and that's not quite, it doesn't quite get at it. Um, Father used the term stable disposition. Thomas will often describe habitus as forms that are like actually really in the soul. 
Um, so when we, talk, when we read St. Thomas on grace, we'll talk about like sacramental grace, three of the seven sacraments. You all know confer an indelible seal, mark, character, and that's in one example of what a habitus would look like. But grace also works in our lives off of you, like these promptings, these movements, illumination. Those are would fall more under motus. So what I'm talking about by speaking of what would it look like, or what does it look like to live a life of the mind, and what habitus this would involve, I just want to give you a sense of what I'm getting at with there, with, with that language. Okay, and um, these uh, the, the habitus that pertain to the life of the mind, um, these they're given, they're graces, um, but they are not just things that are given as objective graces, as with sacramental grace. Um, they have to become formative by being activated, as it were, by deliberate choice and repeated action. So Pope Benedict, in a beautiful essay at the end of a book called Principles of Catholic Theology, when he's articulating the essentially intellective character of the faith, of faith, he says that desire goes before faith, right? Desire is the motive principle of the will. But, as Father said in his first, first talk, this movement is always towards an object who happens to be a person, okay? Um, but in coming to know, that initial capacity for desire and delight is translated into something that intensifies, increases. Um, and in fact, he says, knowledge must increase, not only because we're finite and we tend to err, so on and so forth, but much more important, what we're talking about here consistently in all these talks is the truth that is on the one hand a divine person who is infinitely knowable and depthless in riches. Um, on the other hand, also the, the articles of the faith, the content of the faith. So to put it in a more ordinary way, when we talk about contemplation as being in the presence of one, the beloved, and contemplating with delight, yes, it's a relationship of love like any other relationship. However, this, the day you turn to your best friend or your spouse and say, honey, I know everything about you. I need to know. I'm done. That's not a good day. Don't ever say that. Right. So, so that's just to highlight the, the dynamic, or I think you call it circularity, between the intellective and the affective or the will. Um, yeah, that's the death of love. Okay, so then the question becomes, in order to have this properly intellective affective relationship, primary and secondary causality here are, as you signaled, coinciding in the free choices of our will. We have to take the gifts, the desires that we have, and we have to make choices to bring them alive, but also to conform them to our own particular state of life in a distinctive way that's appropriate to us. So there is a lot to say here. Father already also talked about the inseparability of moral and intellectual virtues, as Thomas illustrates quite colorfully. If you go to wild orgies five nights a week, you're not going to make a great holy hour the next morning. That's just a fact. I think it's kind of funny, but apparently it's not funny. <laughs> but it's obvious, too. But uh, so, so that... that that integration is also a part of this question of what does it look like to live a contemplative life in my particular state. Okay, so I am, as I said, basically ripping off Sertillon for most of this. Um, and the French is better because I do, the, the term vocation even in English, I have some problems with the overuse of that word. I'll say something about that really briefly. But very early on in the French text, he says, and I think that you use this term that the life of the mind is a life that is consacré, it's consecrated. And I hear that word and I think a consecrated religious. He doesn't mean that. He means, he's talking about holiness, like being set apart in your heart and your mind um, in a very practical kind of way. Um, and, and is it a vocation? I have, I have like eight soapboxes and I have a very hard time stepping around. And I just, my, my concern with the use of, of a term vocation throughout a book like this is that we don't make enough distinctions. Um, we're very used to marriage being called a vocation now. And part of the intention of the church and her wisdom is to sort of raise this up in the sacramental dignity. But I don't think it's, I think it's obvious it's not a vocation in the same way that vocation to priesthood and religious life is a vocation. But, and also this can communicate the false idea that discernment is, you know, hearing, the, hearing that voice or finding the flowers from St. Therese or the fiery finger that are at a priest forever after Melchizedek, whereas it probably, I mean, practically speaking, falls much more on the side of, I'm here and I'm choosing this and God is blessing me because what he, the only thing he calls us all to in the strong sense of the word is to holiness. 
And I know that you all understand that well. So let's start with a few principles. I just copied or had um, a very kind person copy the table of contents. Some of you have probably read this work. Father Dominic should buy a copy for everyone um, as he's getting all these donations in at the last minute now. Um, <laughs> I, I, no, I, no, no, it's, it's, it's like fit for academic institutions, fiscal year end is coming up. So I just, I know he has, like, he has, a, lot, he has a lot of bookkeeping to do, that's what he said. Um, but this would be a great book to um, have and dip into and adapt. And I'm just going to give you, I gave you the table of contents so you have a sense of the scope of the work. It's not a long work, it's these teeny tiny pages. Um, and um, this guy, um, Father Sartillon, she is, no big surprise, a Dominican. Um, and I wrote down his dates here somewhere. I always, he died in 1948 or something like that. So he's French, of course, French Dominican. Um, and I will say, if you're interested, I was just in the Holy Land, by the Speedy God, and I was doing some work at the Ecole Biblique, um, hanging it with Father Anthony um, Giambero there. And I found in a random pile of books, a French first edition of this work, inscribed from Saint-Tiange to Father Lagrange, showed to Father Anthony, and we both promptly started then reading it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's a servant of God, so that's not I I idolatrous. Um, but like most of these guys, I mean, he was in France mostly, and um, he has some other really fine works that I don't think have been translated about recollection, for example. You can read a lot of these on the website for the um, French um, National Library. Um, books about problems with atheism uh, in contemporary culture and his lots of comments about, you know, the war great wars and this and that. But this is far and beyond the work that he is best known for. Um, so it is published, I think, originally in the 1930s. Yes, he died in 1948. Oh, he also, as another fun fact, he founded the Revue Thomiste in 1893, which is the, the great French, um, the French version of the Thomist, if we could put it that way. All right, so principles, though, that he lays out. What I'm going to do is just give you the, the some broad stuff that is really important for Celtic and that you'll see other thinkers talk about as well. And then I just thought I'd look a little bit, chapters three and seven, I picked them kind of randomly, but also there's parts that are kind of funny. Um, and uh, but stuff also that's very practical, and not, not all of it do I, do I agree with necessarily, but it's food for thought. Um, so just starting with five principles, um, I said that I, I, I really appreciate the sense of the word consacré in French. Um, to say it's sacred might sound a bit far-fetched, although by the end of Father's talk, it probably doesn't sound far-fetched at all. But to be a bit repetitive, this is because it is fundamentally in service to the truth, and it is a service. So it's always a subordination of every task that we do to the truth, as he puts it, the reality of things. Um, it's kind of not about me. And this is why over and over again, you'll see for him, um, taking from Augustine St. Thomas, the guardian virtue of an intellectual life or a contemplative life is always humility. No big surprise. Um, humility, if you read Peeper's, I should have just brought like 20 books. I insist that you all buy, but fantastic for a book group. Um, Peeper's book on the cardinal virtues. I love a little better than one theological virtues in that he says, we get humility wrong. We think it's like, you are great, I am small. And if you get the movie reference or putting yourself down, Peeper says, humility is to value things as they actually are. It's to know your dignity and that you're not God. So humility is the guardian virtue of this way of life as a service and a service to the truth. Number two, it is, as Father has also said, a contemplative life that is intellectual in form but also affective insofar as it entails and presupposes some degree of friendship with God. As Seltiange says, quote, we must give ourselves from the heart if the truth is to give itself to us. Truth only serves its slaves. It is about the whole person, the moral virtues in service to the higher intellectual virtues. I might talk a little bit tomorrow about that language of slavery, which as an adult convert strikes me as a little bit odd, but once you wrestle with St. Louis de Montfort, it makes a whole lot more sense. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Um, principle three, as a slavery or something total, it can't be vague or occasional. So this is getting at the sense of habitus as stable. So Celtiange does not mean to imply that, um, uh, you, that, um, that it's easy, okay? But he's saying, or that you're going to fail at it regularly. 
Um, but again, as, as Father Dominic suggested, that what we're talking about here is a kind of life-shaping culture. And I, I like this image of the student athlete. I, we have a lot of student athletes at Mount St. Mary's. And the thing that impresses me the most is that they have to learn time management. We can't, they're not supposed to lift in the morning when we have classes, but you know, lift, it's going to work out. If NCAA requires that you have study hall, blah, et cetera, et cetera, you got to get your life in order. It is like your identity is I'm a D1 lacrosse player. So this is a kind of identity or culture, as it were. Um, and he uses this image, despite the fact that he's writing so long ago and in France. On page four, he says, the athletes of the mind, like those of the playing field, must be prepared for privations, long training, and a sometimes superhuman tenacity. But, he says, this vocation cannot be fulfilled by, quote, vague reading and a few scattered writings. It requires penetration, continuity, methodical effort, so as to attain the fullness of development that corresponds to the call of the spirit. So, if you desire a particular end, you've got to suck it up and adopt the appropriate means. Um, as he says, all men by nature desire to know, or this is Seltyon's kind of belief to um, Aristotle, famous first line of Aristotle's metaphysics. Many students read that and think, I don't think it's true. <laughs> Aristotle does not mean that everyone's a natural-born metaphysician. He means this is human nature, and if you're not feeling the desire to know, then that's a problem, and we got to fix that. And we all struggle with this problem, given the poverty of our education. The Celtiange disses people of cowardly hearts and weak brains, so no one in this room would fit that description, though. Fourth principle, as a service or servanthood, and as about the whole person, and as discipline, the contemplative life must be disinterested. And this is something Father was also talking about in his last talk. This gets really tricky, but it's a really important point which to observe that going to graduate school or being a professor is not necessarily the point of what Seltyange is getting at, and often it's not a good way to do this. Um, that disinterestedness, um, someone asked about like what, what would be a particular intellectual vice or a bad motive for study, and yeah, showing away. I'm smarter than you. I know tons of stuff. That's, that's a lot of graduate school. It, it's, it can feel like that a lot of the time, so if, if not actually be that. So it's not about a particular profession or that you're undertaking. Um, and, and Father has also mentioned, I think a good antecedent is St. Augustine's attempt at a kind of intellectual life and community. Um, but prior to that, and prior to his submission to the church, he had to leave the academy, which he described, and remember this, a society of praise and dispraise. Um, Celtiange adds to this that our motives must be unselfish, no ambition or foolish vanity. Quote, the jingling bells of publicity tempt only frivolous minds. Ambition offends eternal truth by subordinating truth to itself, that is, to my ambition. Nothing that is worth anything, he says, is attained without some payment, some sacrifice, as with the previous point. More to the point, a willingness to sacrifice one's own self-regard. One must studiously avoid vanity and empty prattling out of a higher regard for the reality of things. And then fifth and finally, also building on Father's point about friendship, the communal ecclesial context of service to truth requires that we subordinate ourselves one to another with care and examination. Um, even more strongly, Celtian says that truth is very practical. So, and this can come off like a mixed message because that moment of contemplative prayer really is like, or like we, you describe, sometimes you just read something or come across a line of Thomas and it's just like, oh, I love you, Jesus. Like, it's, 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 it's joyful. So, at the end of the day, like, that has to translate into my, my showing mercy to one of my annoying children. Does that happen? I'm not saying that. Or like it must, like in a way, this must. This is a gift, a privilege, and it has to be life giving for the church and for people around me. And thinking um, at, with, with the example of academic work as well, I think it's easy in many disciplines to see that ecclesial social service dimension, as it were. Um, not necessarily in academic philosophy and theology is that always the case, but yeah, Celtiens reminds me that. I am working for the church. Like, I am here for the body of Christ, church, whatever little bits God has given me. And for what it's worth, I was I left Notre Dame after going to school in Canada, did a master's degree in classics there, and I had some great professors at Notre Dame. It's a bit better now, I think, even. 
And I went to graduate school for really naive reasons. I wanted, like Psalm 119, I just wanted, I wanted endless delight. I wanted to meditate on God's law day and night. And it was a huge disillusionment. And I hated academia. So I actually la- left after I did my, um, my comps there and um, got married. And one of the two times in my life, I really am convinced God the Father spoke to me directly with a slap across the faces. Honey, I've really invested in you. You are going to finish this work. Don't know why. So, but that for me, that was just a very concrete experience of how God lavishes us with gifts and graces so generously so that we will be fruitful. And that, again, can look like many, many things. Okay, so five basic principles. Let's get more practical. If you look at the table of contents, you see what he covers, um, the virtues of a Catholic intellectual. We've talked a lot about this already. Organization of life, time of work, field of work, um, spirit of work, preparation for work, creative work. And I'm, I said I'm going to talk about three and seven. Chapter five is actually kind of interesting. Well, they're all interesting, but um, in chapter five, he's, he's very clear about some of what Father was just talking about, the areas, as it were, for contemplative study. And he's absolutely clear you know, you don't, don't be a major in philosophy or theology if that's not your thing. Um, if anything, he sounds, um, he, he's not the only one to do this, very anticipatory of ex corde and all the documents that we had about faith and reason, this and that, the unity of knowledge. What he's worried about is not what you study or what you do, but Seltian, he says, any, is on page 104, any branch of knowledge cultivated by itself does not suffice for itself, but presents danger. So he's warning against over-specialization. Mathematics by itself warps the judgment, accustoming it to a rigor that no other science admits. Still, that's real life. He goes on really harsh. Physiology leads to materialism, astronomy to vague speculation. Literature makes you hollow. Philosophy inflates you. Theology hands you over to false sublimity and magisterial pride. Pretty harsh. Um, but what he's getting at, he concludes, he says, you have to cross your crops in order to not ruin the soil. So he, he's asking us whether we're, you are students, to have a sense of the greatness of what is hoped for in the university task, which is a bunch of people speaking different languages, but who also can talk to each other while respecting the otherness of different disciplinary and practical languages. Um, but, uh, but fundamentally, uh, he's suggesting as ex corde will that this conversation can happen if we all su- submit ourselves as servants to the truth rather than making my area like the only thing that has anything to say and everyone else is, is, a, is a complete moron. Um, but yeah, we, we don't have time to be competent in all these languages. And there is an education issue here that you guys have pointed to in your question um, and answer. Um, one of my mentor, academic mentors, I think so you, some of you know, know Bill Portier. He's like two generations older. He's a great Catholic historian. Went to seminary, then left seminary. So I'm, like just talking to him, just, he, he was doing Latin when he was four in school. And he's read all this. Yeah, I, I, we, we are definitely, we have to deal with the problem, not only that we no longer live in a kind of coherent Catholic culture where you have parish, school, family, community, and it all kind of supports, all the elements support one another, but we're also terribly educated, and I'll just say a couple of annoying things about that later, Um, but yeah, when you read Danima, remember that Aristotle was the son of a marine biologist, that's why he was seen as so threatening in the Middle Ages, because he was like the voice of new science. Okay, So chapter three and chapter seven, as I said, has some really practical stuff about the work of contemplation. He does talk about study very much in the sense of sacred study. So it's not necessarily writing a paper. Um, It could take form of meditation and meditation as a a means to the end of contemplation. Um, But he starts in a very modest place and says very comfortingly, if you want to see things grow big, plant small. And that's a very practical starting point. Um, One of my... Favorite, I teach at the seminary as well as the university, and a, a priest who's a friend of mine, but perhaps betraying his Dominican background, said that all of his spiritual advisees or directees, he recommended, well, they all, they're supposed to, they're supposed to do a holy hour every day. Um, he recommended one hour of theological reading or spiritual reading in addition, and one hour of literature. That's three hours. I can't do that. I'd love to. Okay. 
if you want to see things grow big, start small. So as you hear the things that he talks about, if you can imagine, it's sometimes it just would not work. It doesn't make any sense, but he is practical. He's a realistic man. So chapter three is about order. So not necessarily the order of thought, but the order of life. Um, and you're probably, some people are different in terms of how the exterior and the interior resonate one with another. I can't work in a messy office. I can have mess behind me, but I need clear space. My husband's office is like, high, and if I touch anything, he knows where everything is. And that works for him. I can't, I, I can't have a messy world around me and arise at a kind of orderliness of thought. But here's what he suggests as sort of basic places to start for that exterior order that is supportive of orderliness of thought. Um, and I'll give you four things that, that come out of chapter three, detachment or simplicity, solitude, interior and exterior, quiet, interior and exterior, but also receptive and expressive, I'll explain what I mean. And then number four, again, beginning and ending always with cultivating the, that guardian virtue of humility. Okay, so simplicity. And I, I know that this is very, I think it's very clear what I'm getting at. And you might have some better examples of how this might go. But some form of simplicity is possible and necessary for every state of life. I'm sure you've heard many people say that part of sort of radical about the universal cult of holiness um, is its universality. And many theologians will say that evangelical councils, I, I'm not taking a solemn vow of poverty, I can't, um, like them. But nevertheless, lay people in, within the life of the church and the world are supposed to enact in a lesser and analogous form, poverty, chastity, and obedience. Okay, simplicity. Um, it's possible. If you have a family, you can't take a vow, but um, one can always simplify. I'm not going to talk about, like, what's that thing about the kids watch this thing on Netflix and it led them to fold their clothing neatly for a month, at least a month. I'm not talking about that stuff. Don't worry. Um, Speaking a bit more broadly, um, he, as Celtian says, just go light on the baggage of life. Have what you need. The exterior should be a help, but also a reflection of the order of your soul to God. Get rid of stuff you don't need. Get rid of books you haven't read for five years. Acquire books, of course, but get rid of books that you haven't read in five years. Um, but fulfill the serious obligation of giving alms in all aspects of your life as well. And Celtian briefly touches on that. But as you know, this is a spiritual discipline that's absolutely necessary. Americans are so generous. Catholics are terrible. Sorry, I didn't mean to be critical, but like I, I go to Mass. There's another beautiful shrine. If you come to Emmitsburg, first of all, look me up and we'll have lunch. But I live right at the bottom of the grotto of Our Lady of Lourdes. It's an incredible pilgrimage site. I go to Mass there every day. And it's a Vietnamese pilgrimage. 700,000 people come. It's just so beautiful. Um, and... They, I mean, they can't raise any, They can't raise money just for the ground. So this is a problem. So that there can be a fulfillment of an obligation at the same time as a kind of divesting and retaining a simplicity of, um, in terms of possessions. Saltillon says, if you want to entertain knowledge as your guest, you do not need rare furniture nor numerous servants. Fish. Much peace, a little beauty, and certain conveniences at the same time are all that is necessary. And he talks a bit more about beauty. I think it's important because it's, whether you have children or family or not, you want your home to be warm and a place for hospitality. It's really not. It's for hospitality. And, and there should be that beauty and that joy, but it should be simple. There should be a sense of a, of, of a voluntary poverty there. Number two, solitude is essential. Okay. How many of you are introverts? You know, some of you are not admitting it, I can tell, because you're inside of yourself. Um, I think someone said that of academics, especially like philosophy, PL, like 85%. Okay, there's problems with going too far in either direction. But um, as Celsius talks about solitude, he says, well, it's essential. That's obvious. It's primarily interior, though. And that might sound a bit weird, but back to that image of if you're inviting the guests of Christ the truth into your soul, you need to make space. So this kind of flows from simplicity in a spiritual way. Um, but he talks recurringly about um, interior solitude as recollection. Being alone with God, which as St. Thomas says, the, having God in the soul, the ultimate effect is peace. And I'm told this all the time, like, whatever happens, don't lose your inner peace, which I lose frequently. But that idea of recollection is interesting. And um, 
There are many great spiritual masters who talk about prayer recollection. They don't always mean this, like St. Teresa of Avila does not mean the same thing as Brother Lawrence of the Resurrection. But the latter author, as one example, says, look, you're busy, going from class to class, so and so forth. Brother Lawrence says, I just keep a conversation with God all the time. I have a bad habit sometimes just talking about to myself, like I'm going through like a lecture or something like that, or annoyed at somebody. I should be talking to Jesus, ideally internally, so people don't think I'm crazy. But it's just that 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 remembrance and that that God is the guest of the soul, and because of that, and and the luminescence of His presence, just recall it, give thanks, give thanks, constantly give thanks. Um, so solitude is essential. It is interior, but it's also external. Times of the day, it took me a long time to figure out with young children that I have to get up at four or five. Because I, I can't pray otherwise. I have to be alone. Uh, some people can do the seamless, you know, life, see Jesus in the face of the dirty dishes. Um, I, that's not me. I'm a, I'm a Thomist, so I just see dirty dishes. So I, I know, it's that secondary causality. Um, but, but so like the time of the day, and this, this is where, um, depending on where you are in your education and where you're headed next, um, that starting small so that great things um, come out always set huge objectives during Lent. They don't always go, you know, set some small objectives. And whether you're naturally inclined to sociality or not, that disciplined time um, every day, it's only like five, ten minutes um, in front of the Blessed Sacrament or going for a walk. We hear plenty. We live in a noisy world. The city is noisy. It's true. Um, but it has to be deliberate and intentional in order to cultivate that interior peace. Um, and then a further thing he talks about under solitude is that you, you need your community to support you in this. Um, he says at one point, in the crowd, one has no self-knowledge. He's imagining a kind of sense of dissipation, like Augustine talks about feeling extended, stretched out across times. Um, but yeah, he, basically the spouse of the community is essential to this. And I would like to rewrite Sertillange for ladies, because he goes on for about five, seven pages about how important it is to have a diligent wife who does the dishes and the laundry, and that would be great. Um, I don't have that. Um, but, I, I, but as I've also learned at different times in life as well, because I, I was raised to do everything for myself, that I need help. Um, and if I can't afford it, I have to pay someone to clean my house or whatever. Like, this is not a luxury. It's an absolute necessity because I, I have committed my life in one way or another to this greater good. We can talk more, but I don't want to get too homey with the little examples and definitely don't want to set myself up in any way as an example. But the key point is you got to have people on board. Your spouse has to be supportive of this. Okay. I code of canon law, you know, requires a canonical retreat for clerics and, um, every year. And I would like to see that extended in, at least to mothers. But certainly lay people should all have a, a retreat. That's why I was doing the Holy Land at least once a year, maybe the guys across the road can work on that. Um, number three, quiet. That sounds the same as solitude, but he talks a lot about, um, I said, both expressive and receptive. He says, avoid people who talk way too much. Like, they're just noisy. I'm not, yeah, that's hard to do maybe when you're an academic. Um, but he also says, don't, don't speak a lot unless you really have to. And it's interesting because, again, having been in the Holy Land, where depending on the kind of sites you are, like, the modesty of your dress is very important and go to Orthodox Jewish neighborhood, even more so. But modesty extends to other things as well, uh, as other than dress. It extends to speech, it extends to behavior, actions. And he talks about modesty, basically, like the t how St. Paul talks about the tongue as a little member, but with it we bring fire on ourselves. So, like, be slow. Only speak if you need to, okay? It's just something for reflection. Um, but yeah, avoid people who speak a, a lot. And if we don't have the privilege of living in a cloister, cultivate your interior cloister, but also create the space, the quietness within your home. Okay. And again, you might, there's a time for music. There's a time for a loud party. Um, but pointless noise, he's like, cut it out. I, I, my parents' generation, I don't know if everyone does this. I visit my mother, radio's on from seven o'clock all day. It drives me, I can't, it's insane she can tune it out i can't tune stuff out like that so it's it's probably my my failure and virtue but also it's just it's annoying it's distracting and then again returning to the guardian virtue of humility as the servant 
insofar as we're talking about servitude to the truth, all of this work it has to be seen as a gift and a service that is returned to God. Septian says, Jesus shows us truly that one can be entirely recollected and entirely devoted to others, given to men and living to God. He says, Jesus Christ, when he touches the crowd, he touches the crowd with a soul of silence. He brings both the inner freedom of moral rectitude, but the peace of purity of heart. And I know at this paragraph, I started with the word humility and moved to servitude, but he's really linking those two together. I think if we gave, allowed our Lord to be a kind of example of how to live a contemplative life, I mean, you know very well, there's a time for retreat. There's a time with the inner circle, with the apostles, and then there's a time to be with the thousands. And sometimes he doesn't want to be with. Sometimes they're being really annoying. They're pestering him. But there is a kind of balance there of, um, on the one hand, close um, intimacy with God on the one hand, and being available with that peace and that luminosity to others. Okay, so to conclude on chapter three, then, you might ask, like, who is he talking to? Um, I think he's speaking in a surprisingly contemporary way um, to anyone in any context about things that are clearly goods and virtues that we all need to cultivate. Um, and these practical things, uh, quiet, solitude, I think could be attained in many ways. Of course, I want you all to be Dominicans and contemplative, um, consecrated con contemplatives. Um, but a lot of that stuff, a lot of this is not really possible for us. But that you are here and that you care and that you're intending to serve the truth, you're already starting to enact the disciplines and the practices appropriate to, um, to cultivating this interior peace and solitude. Um, and for what it's worth, too, I'm sure you know this from your own reading, that often these spiritual masters are very practical. Like St. Teresa of Avila, she's a sassy lady. And she had to deal with a lot of problems. Um, you know, keep, keep reading, and, um, and she would just be like, just don't do this. Do this. Um, and very practical as well with respect to recollection and solitude. Chapter 7, let me just take a sip of this. Um, he talks a lot about reading. Um, so chapter seven is on preparation for work. So once we have exterior order, interior order, which is ideal, of course, um, he, he handles work, and this is sort of where I'll end, is where Father, Brett, uh, Father did as well um, with meditation, contemplation. So he's really seeing work, study, as, as a means to the end of contemplation. Um, but he talks a lot about books and reading. And some of the, his suggestions, I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but I, I, they're, they are provocative in a really fruitful way. So he says, pick books well, get advice. He says, don't read a lot. That's interesting. He's like, don't cram. Like, the quality, the, the, the way that you're, like, masticating on the text and, and, and moving around with the mind within it, it is more important than the amount that you read. Um, yes. He taught, yeah, I'll skip this point. Uh, he says, if you can reflect or meditate instead of reading, better to do that. So the reading itself, the study is a kind of means to the end of meditation, which is in the turn a means to the end of contemplation. And I know we can put med meditation study, as Father said, are, are one and the same thing. Um, but he's specifically focusing on reading. He says, submit to the great masters. I don't totally, it's out of these French guys, he says, you know, mostly avoid literature. Um, and I just, I mean, he quotes Pascal, Baudelaire, these guys, again, they're all so well educated. Uh, Father Anthony told me um, the, the founder of the Ecole Biblique, um, I'm a super fan of him, Père Marie Joseph Lagrange. Um, Father Anthony said that up until the end of his life, he always felt, this priest always felt so guilty that he just loved French literature, you know, he, and he would read it. He's a huge fan of Goethe. And Father Anthony and I did this week at 4.30 in the afternoon. He'd make a huge pot of tea and read Goethe in German in the courtyard at the Ecole Biblique. So, of course, we had to do that. Um, but that's why he's such a beautiful writer. I mean, this is, you read Pieper and he's dropping, you know, Goethe, Camus, Sartre. Yeah. One has to make prudent choices, but I think that this is one of the ways in which we are educationally and culturally impoverished. And that's just that we don't read books. So, and I think it, it, I think that reading literature helps us with that enculturation that we don't always have. I don't know if this is the right thing to do, but I started a group in the seminary called Books and Beer. And my self-interest there was because coming into the church, I realized that 
this is not Catholicism is not just about like I believe in God the Father, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera and mag- magisterium, all that kind of stuff. But it's like a culture. It has very distinct strands, and you know, I I, I realize it as little as it helped me really enter into this from afar. You know, reading Graham Greene and these great American Catholic authors, books mostly set in Minnesota in the winter. They're super depressing. Like I had to, I had to come into sort of the richness of like, what is, what is it like? Um, that's just one. And also want to encourage seminarians to be like lifelong learners. But the fact that you, many of you, it sounds like have already started reading groups um, is fantastic. And if you can handle the summa, that's fantastic. But I, I do think on the either literature, somebody mentioned Dante worked really well, and I agree, um, or Sigurd Unset. Um, literature on the one hand, or the kind of books that have been alluded to, so many great Catholic theologians had a kind of deliberate apostolate to write readable books by educated Catholics. Think of names like um, de Lubac, um, Ratzinger, von Balthasar. I, I'm not interested in the big von Balthasar stuff, but he's got all these little books like on meditation, on the creed, that there's a beautiful book on the rosary I'll do to you tomorrow. So in the middle of the 20th century, we have just tons of fantastic theology that is actually readable, um, whereas you know some of, the, some of the bigger volumes are not readable by most people, or maybe shouldn't be read. Um, so I have some disagreement with the literature thing, but that's I, I trust your judgment there. Um, he says, get a master, a guide. Um, and I'm not, I'm not always sure what he means specifically. I don't think he means like a director or a spiritual father. I think he means more of an intellectual guide. Um, it's clear to me when he says, if you find genius somewhere, you know, make friends with that person. Um, and I, I, I think of one academic that I see maybe once a year, maybe the act I saw him at Maria. And I just listen to him for 20 minutes and he'll say one thing that I'll think about for two years. So I think that's kind of what he has in mind. When you meet somebody who often projects or gives forth an aura of, of a kind of simplicity and ease and teaching, fidelity and this, this servitude to the truth that you want, that you find attractive, ask that person what to read and spend time with them. Okay. Um, yeah, and I mentioned before, of course, that that's basically, he handles mostly reading and his sense of, you know, focus more on quality than quantity. Talked about literature, submit to the masters. Um, I do, I would add one thing to this too, that we, given my comment about how terribly educated we are, I, I, I don't think I thought, like did actual cogitation until I got out of high school and had like an intellectual conversion. Maybe like high school English class, or I don't know, like when I read Kafka and was traumatized. But <laughs> it's like we don't it, educate. This is a huge problem, and I don't think there's any, there's much in the way of easy solutions. Um, but I, I would suggest, and never mind research, um, it's abysmal. Um, I, I would suggest something that he might not think of, which is if you don't have another language, um, especially a language used for theological study, perhaps like Latin or Greek, start learning it. Um, and I say that because. Often that study of language um, helps one understand more clearly the beauty and the, the parameters of thought. Um, I, there are people who study New Testament at the graduate or licentiate level who don't even know Greek. And I think that's criminal. But, and you might think, she's going back to the academic, ooh, I have all these languages thing. Some of the most profound homilies I've heard, just enough Greek to use like an interlinear, some of those beautiful homilies I've heard actually attend to like one or two words and the richness of meaning and how it's used by St. Paul here in this way. Um, or or why, why is the tense different? Like, you know, the words of institution in the Mass, that is not what they are in the New Testament. That's just cool stuff to meditate on and learn more about. So just a personal recommendation is if, if that discipline is something that's attractive to you or it fits your life, I think it's really important to at least study some Latin and possibly Greek or a modern language. We should all know Spanish. Okay. Um, one last thing, though, in the reading, too, that, that Father was also alluding to, um, to the question about what's a bad way to read or a bad motive. He says, um, don't read with a critical eye. If you are reading with the end of meditation, with the actual end of contemplation, you're reading in a formative way, not a critical way. So you want to be changed, as it were, transformed, formed by the text. 
um, and you shouldn't be like nitpicking at, at it and, and finding things to critique. And this is where he talks about not only the virtue of humility, but the virtue of docility, um, that kind of flexibility of soul that allows the light to enter and shine it more clearly. Okay, so I'm I'm kind of just going to abruptly stop there with um, with Sertillange, and there might be some other stuff that you see in the table of contents there that you'd like to talk about. But I want to close with um, coming back to the meditation contemplation distinction um, and the undeniable superiority of everything in the Dominican tradition. Am I being unsubtle? Sorry, that's not for your benefit. It's just it's just true. Um, but but I but I, I but I was reading. Actually, this is a fantastic book for um, occasional like like daily reading, spiritual reading. Um, I can show this. It's Simon, Father Simon Tugwell has written some really lovely books. He's an English Dominican. Um, but he has this chapter where he talks about an author that I, I do have students read when I am um, privileged to teach at the History of Christian Thought class to majors. Guigo the Carthusian. Um, it's a great name. And he's talking, he died in 1188. And Father um talks about his handling of meditation in a work um, called the... Um, it's a ladder of monks. Yes, ladder of monks. And many writers of more on the negative theology side, sometimes on the affirmative theology side, um, will use ladder metaphors. Obviously, it's biblical and such. And this ladder is how monks get from earth to heaven, which is kind of cool. Um, and he talks about distinct practices of the spiritual life. And he opens this book, interestingly, by saying that is Guigo that this method, this ladder, came to him in a flash while he was doing manual labor. So even for him as a Carthusian there, he's, he's envisioning a kind of balanced life, um, whether it takes a sort of Benedictine form or, a Dom or Dominican form more. And so the four steps of the ladder are reading, meditation, prayer, contemplation. And we've talked about, especially the meditation, prayer, contemplation, enough to see that sometimes they're really, I mean, they all feed in one to another. Contemplation kind of stands apart as, um, as the end in itself that we're after. Um, so for Guigo, meditation is a means to the end of contemplation. I'm just going to read a selection from this work by Guigo. He says, reading is a directing of the mind to a careful looking at the scriptures. Meditation is a studious activity of the mind, probing the knowledge of some hidden truth under the guidance of our reason. Prayer is a devout turning of the heart to God, to get ills removed or to obtain good things. Contemplation is a certain elevation above itself of the mind, which is suspended in God, tasting the joys of eternal sweetness. So reading looks for the sweetness of the life of blessedness. Meditation locates it. Prayer asks for it, and contemplation tastes it. It's lovely. Reading, as it were, puts the food in our mouth. Meditation chews it and breaks it down. Prayer obtains the flavor, and contemplation is the sweetness itself that makes us glad and refreshes it. And also, as Father pointed to Aristotle, has, has said, those first two runs reading meditation could be done by anyone, any context, but properly secular as well as sacred. But he's talking about meditation as an act of meditating on the Bible. I'm going to read you another quotation. It's kind of wild here. Guigo says, meditation begins to consider how glorious and delightful it would be to see the long-desired face of the Lord, beautiful in form before all the sons of men, no longer abject and vile, no longer having the appearance with which his mother clothed him, but robed in the garment of immortality and crowned with the diadem with which his father crowned him on the day of his resurrection and glory, the day which the Lord has made. So there's like six passages of scripture in those three lines and a lot of play, like stuff is kind of moved around, and it's the kind of playful meditation on scriptural imagery that makes biblical scholars go absolutely crazy time. Um, but when you're living in, when within the, the context of, 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 a, of a cloister or um, a monastery, you know, there's a safety that allows that. But what, um, what, what, what Father Tugwell is, is drawing out here is that I take him to be saying that if you're engaged in kind of meditation, ideally with a scriptural text or a theological text, and you have in mind, which we see enacted in these quotations, the three rules from the catechism. You're all familiar with these, right? I quiz you, right, for reading scripture. First of all, you have to take all of it into account, read in light of the analogy of the faith, 
and also with the tradition and the magistrate of the church. So assuming these things are underway, what is being described here is a kind of, like what Father was saying, sometimes you read something in St. Thomas and you just, it's awe, it's beautiful, it's glorious, um, it's, it's delight. And, and he's having a kind of playful, delightful meditation in the scripture. But the use of light in that last quotation is really interesting. The diadem with, with which the Father crowned him on the day of his resurrection and glory, the day which the Lord has made. Thomas reflects a lot on the different kinds of light, light of the transfiguration, light of blessedness, glory. But Guigo is arguing that that kind of light that comes with contemplation, with being in the presence of the Lord, knowing that one is illuminated by grace, and then entering into the heavenly court in, in, this, in this moment of contemplation, he's linking this to the activity of scriptural meditation to the light of the resurrection the glory, and, and glory in some way. It's a little bit unclear. Um, and just to finish up here, he says, um, reading and meditation here, we see, laid the foundation for the whole spiritual exercise. They are indispensable. This is how I'm sort of pulling out um, Septiange less practically in the end. Without reading, meditation has no protection against error or no food. And it is as a result of reading and meditation that we are moved to pray and to delight. Meditation both indicates that we need to pray for what we need to pray for and fires up our will so that we will pray with real eagerness. Um, and so, and Guigo says, um, back to the original text, he says, I sought your face, O Lord. Your face, O Lord, have I sought. I have long meditated my heart, and my meditation of fire grew, desire to know you more and more and more. This is Ratzinger's point about the intellective and affective circularity that is proper to faith. While you break the bread of sacred scripture for me, you have come to, to be known to me in the breaking of bread. And the more I know you, the more I long to know you, the longer, no longer in the husk of the letter, but in sensed experience. That's what we're after. So thank you if you want to talk about anything else or ask some questions. Okay. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And, and I really want to encourage Father, depending on where our conversation goes, um, Father can join me here. <laughs> no, I'm just no, what I, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, advice about graduate school. Can you make that actually a little more specific? The question, it, it, as pertains to what we're talking about, contemplation, or like if it's more broad, then maybe after. Yeah, it's. I was joking. I mean, it, it, it's a privilege. My husband and I say the same thing. Any student comes to us, no debt, have a plan B. The job market is, every time we have a position in the theology department, like when I applied, there were 100 applicants. It's crazy. But you want, you want to be thinking, so no debt and have a plan B because, and you don't want to, part of the plan B is you can't stay there so long that you become useless for any other function in human society. Um, <laughs> like, I'm serious though, like you, um, I, sometimes I, like I have friends who, one was in graduate school, and his wife was working nights, the kids, as a nurse um, down in you know, North, North Carolina. Many places you'll end up, if you have a, if your state of life is marriage, you cannot support a family on one academic salary. So whether it's during graduate school or, yeah, in some other way, yeah, you, you want to have a plan B and or some very practical kind of safeties. Speaking about this stuff, though, I mean, and you'll get good advice from lots of people. I mean, you want to go to a place where you know that you'll have, you want to get in, so you have to have something to work with. But you want to go somewhere where you'll, you can do this stuff, and you'll be supported in it. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, can you elaborate more on how to find, like, uh, an intellectual master or that kind of, how that different from, like, a uh, spiritual director? Right, so the question is finding an intellectual master. And that was one point I think I mentioned that I wasn't entirely sure. I, I had that experience. It, he's not super clear on what that looks like. So I, I, well, in my case, um, there's this wonderful, um, I did my undergraduate and master's degree in the classics department at Dalhousie. And my mentor there was a holy fool like that's a good thing like he was just i i wanted to be him when i grew up except for being a man and so the priest and stuff um, but 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 it was it was what he did his devotion but his joy and his rose guard like he 
this is, this is a part of every great, pretty much every conversion, reversion, or vocation story is you see someone who embodies and you're like, I want that. So I think it's sort of luck, as it were, like not as there's no fifth chance it's luck, but coming across that, pe- that kind of person. My second thought is grab one of the Dominicans here. Or if you, if you, if just because for many of them, they are dedicated to this, this kind of work. And if you kind of hit it off with one of them, I, I mean, what I would do, and I, I, I wish I did this more, I think I'd be a better scholar, is just like once a month, you know, write to the person or have a conversation, um, talk about a book that you're reading, something like, I think analogous to spiritual direction there, that sort of accountability is really helpful. So, um, yeah, it doesn't have to be a priest. And of course, which he, uh, that is more of a spiritual direction, he said, just need somebody a step ahead of you, but I think that's more dangerous here. I, I like the idea of like a master at whose feet I want to sit. So, any anyone else have thoughts on that? Maybe, maybe we can come back to it. Sorry, question? Different question? Yes. Uh, you brought up the, the point that um, not reading a lot is a good thing, yeah. uh, especially when it's in the service of meditation. Mm. But um, something that's really challenging, especially for this age group, is the pressure that. I'm behind. There's so much I need to read yep. and so much I need to learn. And people and can't read sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. that can be crushing yeah. a lot of the time. Especially, yeah. uh, I study philosophy, and that's a very uh, prevalent kind of discouragement. Yeah. Yes. And so, like, yeah. as we're trying to form uh, the circumstances of our own uh, respective intellectual lives, mm-hmm. how are ways we can navigate that kind of discouragement? I d- I think some, or yeah. So a question, the question is about um, the difficulty of reading, the discouragement that comes with that. And I mean, I think your, his point about don't read too much. I mean, it makes sense. Like if you if you haven't, uh, I'm, I'm reading this book called The Virtue of Trust by um, um, it's a Belgian Jesuit. It's an ex. I can read two paragraphs and I don't need to read anymore. It's frustrating though. I want to read the whole thing. Get to the chapter in St. Therese, but I'm stuck in, yeah, it's fine. What you're talking about, like if you're in like high level philosophical study, um, I think that teachers, formators let, let students down a lot here. Maybe because they themselves don't have the training. Like I was re- I was studying Greek when I had went started my undergraduate. I had like at seminars in Dianema, symposium. I, um, no one really taught me how to read in that way. So maybe you or we have ideas, uh, could come up with ideas together about how to, yeah, how to do this better. And I, I one seminarian who's now a priest in Arlington, brilliant guy, so smart, talked about how when he studied um, biology at Notre Dame, he said, when you study biology, you do lab research beside a professional. And by doing it with them and seeing them, uh, you learn how to do it. In the humanities, I don't think we do that well at all. So... I'm not helping you with the discouragement thing, but I, I think they're with difficult philosophical reading like that. I often say to students, and they might take this as license to do something bad, but like if, if I give you 50 pages of St. Thomas, which I, I don't do a lot of St. Thomas with undergraduates. I read Summa Country Tales with seminaries. Like, I can give you some notes that might help, but like you, you're not going to read all of it. Like You need to get a sense of what's going on and then read to like a few articles really, really closely. And then, so I think there are techniques you can learn for how to read efficiently. Um, and, um, and for some people, like note-taking is... I, I always say to students, and they don't do it because they want to return their books or their rentals. Like, that book is yours. It's your friend for life. You mark it up. But you, you might find other things are more useful as well. So, But that's a really great point about a, another challenge that you unjustly face in undergraduate education. Yeah. Uh, I actually have something to... Uh, oh, yeah. Go for it. Um, there's actually a, a book that got rec- that was given to me by a friend uh, by Mortimer J. Adler called How to Read a Book. Yeah. Yes, yes, that's, that's a great book. Yeah, yeah. that's um, fantastic. Not every book has to be read cover to cover. Some you just intellectually skim, mm-hmm. gather what it gets, and just that's all it yeah. really takes. Uh, so, yeah. uh, so if for I guess everybody going into philosophy or any type of reading, which I guess we all are, some yeah. part of those gets to, mm-hmm. um, I definitely recommend that book yeah. because it's been pretty good when it comes to my studies. How to yeah. read a book, Mortimer J. Adler. Excellent, yeah. And I, I think you might talk about this too, like in light of, like, I've used Summa Contra like eight times in a class. 
I don't understand it. Like, like I do, I understand a lot of it, and I see things I didn't get right, and I do try to communicate to students. Like, if you're reading philosophical texts, like, and, and you, like, if you're reading Aristotle's Metaphysics, you know, like the central four books about, you know, super sensible being, um, like, it's going to be, you're going to take, you're going to be scraping the surface. But that's part of the joy of this kind of work, of, of intellectual meditation work, is it's mysterious, it's depthless in its riches. You know? So take heart. Yeah. Yes. yes. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Yep. Oh, sort of just following up on that question. So something that I notice in myself as advice, and, and as you mentioned, the pastor, in, the, in your lecture, was avoiding the temptation to read with a critical eye. This mm-hmm. is something that I find myself often struggling with, especially when I'm challenged to engage like texts in modern and contemporary philosophy where I feel as a student like I'm in the like in a threatening intellectual environment, so to speak. Like yeah. there's part of me that wants to engage like the confidence of the faith, knowing like I can read this freely and maybe like asking St. Thomas for help kind of Crit- like critically in the sense that I'm that I'm, I'm t- taking it in and, and kind of dialoguing with it in, in meditatio. Like I don't know. I guess my my question is like, yeah, how to cultivate? I think especially in in an academic environment that is like formative, formatively deficient. Like mm-hmm. how to avoid this temptation when engaging with texts that we know from the stance of the church are not. Like okay. the fullness of the truth? I don't know. Got it. Yeah. It, so the question is, oh, that's my feedback. The question is um, about like what Celtiange is getting at. Like, don't read in a nitpicky, critical way if you're in a mode of formation. So I guess I'd make a distinction here. I think the kind of text he's talking about is something that is from the tradition, that's like from a master, that's that that's as it were safe, that's that's rich, that's to the test of time. In that case, it's like. Yeah, even for me, try to figure out how to talk to my spiritual re- recollection. Of like, this person says this, this person says this, thanks a lot. So more like, that's bad. Uh, like, I should just be taking it in patiently and, and, and trusting um, the person who's giving me the advice. I, I, don't, I, I don't know what kind of books you're talking about there, too. I mean, just to kind of shift a bit, and I'm completely open to strong disagreement here. I, I, think, I think we have to read a lot of that stuff. And I think, like, taking the models from, like, Father Lacan's or even Saint-Tignan's, that sometimes we should read edgy stuff. I mean, people is quoting Sartre all the time. Part of what he's doing there is showing that as the existentialist denies being, they become oddly metaphysical. Like, sort of the circle comes around. And, um, yeah, so, but I think there, too, having the friends, other people reading it that you can talk to um, is really helpful. So, but, again, I... You only have time for so much reading, so um, yeah. I hope that's a little bit helpful, though. Yeah. Uh, actually, it's no element. Uh, like those of us who are pursuing like doctorate degrees in like not philosophy and theology, mm-hmm. um, and we're trying to like become experts in that field, and then under our research, our teaching, and everything, we also want to become like Catholic or become Catholic as well. Yeah. Yes. Like, how can we like per week or whatever? What's like Kind of about we can allocate to pursuing that. So, I know, is, like, you know, it depends. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. What, what area of study are you planning on? Oh, I'm a doctoral student in, um, like, community psychology. psychology. Okay. Yeah, and I, I mean, I like his start small so that things flourish. And, I mean, we're talking, of course, about, about primarily about one's, one's prayer life, one's discipline prayer. And so... Having those, you know, whether you're doing some of the divine office or something like that, and or or just spending time with, I think he's imagining reading texts that are spiritually life giving, um, and yeah, you set aside uh, like 15 minutes, you know, a day. Do it if you have kids. Do it in the morning before they get up, or if that works for you, or maybe you're a late night person. It's it's hard to say not knowing like you in the context, but. I think also, um, if you feel like you're nurtured spiritually and intellectually where you are, um, thinking about your discipline as well. Like, I'm a big fan of, like, the separateness. I think we have one scientist who sometimes talks about the face of Jesus and cells. And <laughs> He's not Catholic, but whatever. Catholics can be weird. Um, but that's to say, like, at the same time as just, as John Paul II says, doing your discipline really well with honest adherence to its principles... Also, there's a lot of really interesting theological writers and a lot of um, 
I, I've had a lot of students who are majors in both psychology and theology. There's some very interesting writers who, yeah, talk about in a really intellectually, intellectually rich way the history of the discipline and how it might resonate with things that are more central to the Catholic tradition. So that, that's just another thought that you might find doing some reading that nobody else is going to be doing in your field that links to your faith and the life of your mind could be one, one suggestion. So some great stuff in psychology. Marx is super cool. Can you expand on your um, vocation soapbox and like really misunderstanding? Oh, sure. I never should have said it. <laughs> I, I that vocation soapbox. No, it, it just, I mean, on the one hand, I want to be, I want to be theologically correct. There's a way in which marriage is I'm describing the order of nature and a, a, a call to priestly and religious life is supernatural. So when Thomas asks that the question or proposes the question, Summa Contemptilis 3, is celibacy unnatural? The first correct answer is yes, it's unnatural because we're made for this. We're made for to reproduce the, the species. We're made for society. And then, of course, he goes on to say, but, you know, not everybody has to do. He gives five super brief, really brilliant arguments like, you know, vision of society is complicated. We need some people to do some stuff, some people to do other stuff, so on and so forth. So on the one hand, marriage is raised up from nature to supernature sacramentally. Although having just done like, the second time sacraments class with undergraduates, it's super problematic that marriage is a sacrament. Someone's going to get me in trouble. It's just, it, it's a long, it's a long history. It's quite a long time till it's talked about why it's a sacrament. And that in itself is interesting. And then one student did a paper on why, why are religious vows not sacramental, um, where the marriage vow is sacramental, right? You're, you're the minister of the sacrament. And then on the other hand, how come, you can, how come a religious can be released from solemn vows and marriage entails an indissoluble bond? Lots of cool. We're not going to go there. But so in the light of vocation, I just, sometimes you'll see some books, especially in the last 20 years, everything's a vocation. And that word means to be called to something. And I think that if a man has a vocation to the priesthood, that's just kind of a, a slight, a different order than, than being called to marriage. It's a different kind of thing. Feel free to disagree with me. Um, and, and again, but, but the church in calling it a vocation wants to highlight its dignity. It is the end of marriage is the same as the end of every other state of life, which is holiness, sanctification. Um, and this is where, if, if you read like parts of Theology of the Body, where John Paul II talks about the complementarity of celibate and married states of life, he's like, these make sense of each other and they need each other. Um, because marriage in the order of nature, they need to be reminded by the celibate that my husband does not complete me. Only Jesus does. He's a means to that end. And then the celibate or the priest, he's thinking, I think, primarily of Dawson priests or religious priests, but also women religious, they learn about what motherhood and fatherhood is from from the married, so we should talk about that more over a beer, though, maybe. So it's yeah, I it I, I started teaching right after I was teaching the church in a seminary, and there's I think that I shared with some priests concern about like this angst. I need a confirmation that God is saying you will be a priest. It, it just doesn't work like that, and, and it's just the anxiety sometimes. And like I must have this kind of certitude. Whereas on the one hand, it's it's an act of fidelity and bravery. On the other hand, God works through the church. So if the people say yes, the bishop says yes, you're for, yeah, I, you, you're, this is, you know much more about this than I do, the guys in white over there. Like, tr trust the signs, the confirmations that you've already received. So that's all. Uh, so I've got a bit, a bit of an uh, interesting position because I am said to be a mechanical engineer. Uh, I am a third order Dominican uh, who is very much in love with uh, the rich intellectual tradition of the Catholic Church. I would love to be more involved in the intellectual mm -hmm. spheres of Catholicism. Um, however, I don't think I will really have time or money for a doctorate or anything like that. Uh, and I oh, like in theology or something? Yeah, like in theology or something like that. But don't so have to do it. I, like, yeah. so, is it like, yeah. so is it like taboo or like a weird thing for me as like a, you know, even though I am being formed intellectually by the Dominican order, through my third order, and through my own personal studies, for me to engage in that intellectual life. And like, what kind of would that look like for people right. in similar shoes? Yeah. And, and you're, you're, you're drawing clarity from the many words I've said, a, a really important basic point. He's not talking about Dominicans. Yeah. Like, this is, and 
again, the first line of Aristotle of metaphysics, all men by nature is, um, all men by nature desire to know. Once I tell you to philosophy, an undergraduate argued with me for an hour about whether that was true. He's like, I'm looking around, can't, I don't I don't see evidence of this desire to know in the world. It was a good it was a great argument. I mean, it was it was a good discussion to have. Um, it's it's just awakening that desire and subordinating it to the the only end that's worthy of that kind of attention and love, which is the truth of Jesus Christ. So you have to, and you'll be doing it in a way. He's also talking about, by talking about work and ways of work and time of work, he's also talking about you being a holy mechanical engineer, you know, and, and not being the, yeah, the kind of jerk academic that father was sort of picturing and stuff like that. Like that's your service. So um, yeah. Okay. Any general advice for, uh, for people who seek grad education in theology? Um, it, advice, so the graduate school question and theology. I heard Father Dominic speaking to someone the other day. Um, it depends on what you want to do in theology. So if you want to do scripture, are you an undergraduate or master's student? Um, I'm graduating next semester. Okay. Um, I, I, I mean, there's a lot to say there, but I think... I think it's widely acknowledged from the Catholic side of things that Notre Dame and CUA have the strongest programs, but there's other places who are fantastic. Like now Durham University does historical theology better than most places. There are some, um, um, so I just talk, talk, we can talk some more as well, um, but I, was, I start preparing yourself very often in theology, and philosophy is different here. Very often they want you to have an MA first. So I'd find a cheap way to do, and, and like Notre Dame, you can do an MA or an MDiv or that, and then you kind of I reapply um, to go on. Um, like we have students who come up to the seminary, or um, like lay people who will do a master's degree at the seminary while being a grad assistant. Again, avoiding debt. Um, but there, there are other programs, and do, I, I would also start on the mastering the language thing, because if you apply to graduate school and they see that you're already developing facility with whatever you'll need, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, love it, because we are bad at languages on the whole. Yeah. Yeah. Just become a Dominican. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.thomisticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.